Um, my name is Gary Testa. I'm the uh, president and CEO of Engineered Fluids, and with me is Darwin Klopp. I'm with uh, Liquid Cool Solutions out of uh, Minnesota. Great. And today we're going to talk to you about a uh, what we think is a far more operational approach um, to liquid immersion cooling. And so uh, with that, we're going to start. I'm going to talk primarily around uh, the fluids, the dielectric fluids, what my company manufactures, engineered fluids. We're based out of Tyler, Texas. We specialize in the manufacture uh, and design of specialty dielectric fluids, specifically for use in full immersion coolings. Uh, we do this uh, for semiconductors. We also do it for batteries, electric, uh, actually electric motors and electric vehicles as well. And so uh, together we think we actually have what we believe is both an operational and a very cost effective manner to deploy full immersion cooling and get tremendously greater rack densities. So why don't we go ahead and go. click through it. There we go. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. I think everybody's familiar uh, with these three methods of cooling. Cold plates are direct to chip. This is primarily used um, in order to get uh, higher capacity CPUs into existing server architectures. It takes a lot of plumbing. You have to mount a, a very specific cold design cold plate onto each CPU. Back of rack cooling, again, a great way of increasing density uh, in an existing rack by basically putting a rack, uh, a large radiator on the back of the rack and then adding fans. Um, Two-phase immersion, which we just heard a little bit about, we'll get into some more. A very interesting approach that uses the actual phase change of the fluid to remove heat. Um, the difficulty with the first two, frankly, is that while they get you greater density, they do nothing to help you with your power consumption. In fact, they tremendously increase both the complexity of the rack as well as the power consumption. And in addition to that, it brings water directly into the rack system itself, which obviously can be a problem. Um, Two-phase cooling, of course, is a, another approach um, in which you fully immerse the electronics in the, uh, in the fluid itself. It changes phase. That phase change moves a tremendous amount of heat out. Um, however, it too has a few drawbacks. So um, talk briefly about this. Improves efficiency. Water. Uh, I don't know if anybody has been looking at the press lately. There's a, uh, a French data center that had a, a pinpoint leak in a 500 PSI water line in their data center. Um, pinpoint leaks are actually more tragic than absolute failures because pinpoint leaks atomize the water and then the water condenses on everything in the data center. So effectively to clean that mess up, they had to shut the entire data center down for two and a half months and run giant humidifiers in. Very expensive, very painful way to clean that up. So um, our belief is, is that anytime you bring water into the data center, it's not if, it's just when. Um, also interesting is that I've recently heard that a number of uh, data center insurers have changed their rates for anybody bringing water directly into the data room. Um, did we skip one? I think we Might skipped have. one. No? There we go. No? Okay. No. Nope. Two-phase immersion. Um, so two-phase immersion, as this picture shows, is very interesting. We've heard a lot about it. This is the use of fluorinated fluids, which have very low boiling uh, points. And what you do is you submerge the device into this fluid. The fluid then vaporizes, and then you basically recondense the vapor in order to remove the heat. Um, extremely efficient at removing heat. This is actually one of the most efficient ways because it makes use of the phase change. However, there is uh, a number of very difficult points that you have to deal with. One is, and our, and our speaker prior to us just talked about it, is high pressure. So anytime that these fluids basically go through a phase change, they increase the ambient temperature in your system 24 times. So now you're dealing not just with a fluid, but with a highly pressurized system. Now, a lot of the times you'll see that the tanks that are used here aren't fully sealed. The difficulty with that in a two-phase environment is that it's a vapor. And when vapor escapes into the room, it goes into the air. Two things happen at that point. You breathe it in if you're in that room. It also condenses on everything else in the room. So in operation, you end up with a lot of this fluorinated fluid actually condensed all over the inside of the 
the data room, which, you know, in my opinion is a problem, uh, particularly because I don't want to be breathing in any kind of fluorinated fluids. It happens to be two and a half times the weight of water. If you look at the way your lungs are designed, they have a mucus layer in them. That's actually what protects us from particulates in the air. When a fluorinated fluid enters your lungs, it sinks below the water or below the mucus layer in your lungs and pools in the villi not a very effective manner of continuing to transport oxygen into your blood. The other issue though, I think is, other than safety, is something called microcavitation. Now microcavitation is actually where the boiling action of the fluid itself in a phase change, and this is not just unique, by the way, to fluorinated fluids. This happens in any fluid that undergoes a phase change. If you talk to pump manufacturers or propeller manufacturers for boats, any time that you have cavitation occurring, what's actually happening is, is that the, by the very energy release that occurs as it turns to vapor, it begins to erode all the metal components. So we actually have a number of customers, primarily bit miners, who have a lot more experience with this, that are actually finding that the dielectric strength of their coolant radically decreases as the number of microscopic metallic particles in their coolant increases, forcing them actually to replace the coolant. The coolants in for two phase tend to be very expensive. So outside of the fact that we have a, a tremendous health hazard, we also have the fact that we're basically eating our devices alive. These make for two very difficult problems. Now, one of the solutions that we have heard in two-phase is to coat everything with another substance that would act effectively like a zinc on a boat in protecting electrolysis. It would be the sacrificial layer. That, I think, is a very expensive undertaking. I think a far simpler one, and obviously one that I advocate because we manufacture these products, full disclosure, is a simple single-phase immersion. They're very effective at removing heat. Our products are 1,600 times have the heat density of air, so very efficient at moving heat. Um, it eliminates all the fans. Our products are biodegradable, non-toxic, non-allergenic. Um, for, for those of you interested, I actually did a video when we were at Mobile World Congress where somebody challenged me to drink it. I was happy to drink my own product um, to prove that it is non-toxic as well as biodegradable. You know, the, the biggest issue that we've had to date, frankly, with these types of approaches is that most of them were designed around open tanks. And this is, frankly, where Liquid Cool, I think, has really done a tremendous job and exactly what Darwin is going to talk about. And how do we operationalize single phase immersion cooling? So the magic that we provide, obviously, is the coolant. There was a question earlier about material compatibility. That is the single biggest challenge outside of making something biodegradable and non-toxic. Okay, material compatibility is absolutely key. That's one of the big challenges that Two-Phase has because technically it's not material compatible with most metals. It actually eats it away. Our product does not have that problem. There's only one type of material that we don't play nice with, vulcanized rubber. It occurs in a small number of very inexpensive power capacitors. That's the only thing that we found, and we're actually working on a solution for that. Everything else that you find as a common material on a server board, our material is compatible with. We actually are uh, confident enough to offer a 10-year operational warranty on our products. Okay, so we're willing to very much stand behind both our compatibility testing as well as our characteristics. I think, you know, outside of eliminating all the water, eliminating all the server fans, it's a very low flow rate. We're talking about literally quarters of a liter a minute, a kilowatt to remove heat, and almost as important, almost no pressure. So when you really start to look at the economics that are involved in liquid immersion cooling, what you quickly find out is that it's a very simple system. It uses entirely off-the-shelf components with the exception of the coolant and the proper enclosures, and it's highly effective and very, very cost efficient. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Darwin to walk us through how to properly enclose this type of material. Oh, there's one other slide, one but other we, can, slide. we can bunch over yeah, there. We'll, we'll go through this one quickly. I think Gary covered most of this. Uh, just doing a comparison between various uh, fluids. The one question I get asked a lot is, what is your fluid? And I usually introduce them to Gary, but we're not mineral oil. I get asked that question all the time. The second thing is we're not two-phase. And so we've been trying to focus the conversation that we're single-phase and, and single-phase alone. So liquid cool, here's our approach. 
Um, our company has actually been in, years, in business for a number of years. We actually started out as a gaming company about 10 years ago. And we've redirected it into data center, and now very specifically into cryptocurrency mining. So we're, we're getting ready to do something there as well. So the point is in saying that is that we have roughly 10 plus years of experience. We learned a lot of things about material compatibility that Gary mentioned. We learned, we started out with mineral oils, we started, we, net, we um, have moved to uh, this type of fluid, and really our patents boil down to a couple very simple things. We take the fluid, we direct it right on top of either the CPU or the GPU. What you're looking at is you're actually looking at what we would call a heat sink. We get asked that question, it's really not a heat sink. What it really is, it's the directed fluid flow. That's where we have one of our patents. The fluid then comes out from underneath the heat sink and it floods the rest of the server chassis. And in this case, we actually have an enclosed server. So we, two things that we focus on is directed flow and encased servers. So think extruded, an extruded box that the server sits inside. Here's how it works. Uh, this particular design, we've actually, it's a two socketed design. We've had it since, uh, we've had it roughly um, about seven years now. We've gone every, from the first Xenon up to the current state uh, V4. And now we have to navigate onto the Skylake instance, but it's very, very effective. It's actually one of the tools that we've used with a lot of the research uh, firms and gotten a lot of feedback from NREL and other company, other uh, government bodies and, and universities around the effectiveness of cooling. With this solution, we've been actually demonstrated to deliver a uh, PUE of 1.02, and that's at the total solution. Um, kind of kind of see the benefits of it, but we say, you know, it runs much cooler, and I'm going to show you some data on that next. And really what we can bring to the table is compute density. We can enable compute density with this type of application that normally wouldn't be achieved. And I'm going to say that we don't necessarily, the x86 world, if you want efficiency, you want a better PUE, you can do that with this. If you want to enable very, very dense GPU solutions, very, very dense storage in the future, you want to start looking at this kind of a fluid. And we believe that we need to start doing some, I would say, partnership development to actually begin enabling that. Because what we're seeing from an enablement standpoint in the Bitcoin space is um, tremendous value that we can bring. Uh, this is from data that we have uh, uh, did some years ago, but demonstrated over and over again. But in, in effect, the CPUs operate 30 degrees cooler in the fluid. Uh, so if you say the ambient in, intake fluid temperature, the delta T rise is 15 degrees or so. Depends on how, how fast you flow the fluid over the, over the GPU or CPU. The other thing is we, there also comes a power benefit. So if, you're, if your electronics are running cooler, you get a power reduction there, plus you don't have any fans. So you add that up in a server space, it, it literally is 20%. And what we're currently doing in other, other uh, areas of the market, um, ant miners specifically, we're achieving 10%. So somewhere between 10% and 20%, you'll, you'll achieve uh, electronic savings. That can either be captured and saved, or you can increase compute density at the rack level. So you can choose how you want to use that. Here's just kind of a uh, draw up of uh, how we could deploy these servers. Um, I would probably tell you we're not actually in the server blade business, but we do have deployments. So that's kind of what I want to jump to next. We, have, uh, we did, a, we did a, a pretty extensive study with the help of Wells Fargo with NREL over the last two years. Uh, they just published the uh, paper a few months ago. You guys can all take a look at that if you'd like. Uh, they've actually taken the servers that they have deployed and are running in uh, Docker. Uh, on bare metal kind of an application with, with our servers, and they're using that for their research team. We also have a site in Milwaukee where we have CBRE who has an installation in a server closet. Uh, their challenge was how could they get more compute power uh, and deliver a couple of mission critical services they were trying to run and without putting air conditioning in, bringing air conditioning in the, into the closet. In this case, they put in three of our servers, uh, two hots and a spare and are actually able to deploy two mission critical apps. One of them is actually a, a monitoring system for a nationwide department store and call center operations. That's, that's what they're doing with it there. So these are probably our two best examples of what we would call scaled out operations. These aren't large scales, but it demonstrates the capability of the, uh, of the application. 
just kind of some numbers for you if you're curious about um, you know, other typical questions we get are how much does it weigh, how much, um, how much mass does it add to the rack, and kind of get a, a perspective on how, what the technical specs are in a fully populated rack. <clears throat> uh, we've also taken some, um, done some work on OCP concepts and taken a look at what happens if you repackage the 2U server, an open compute 2U server in liquid enclosure. And a couple of things that come out of it is that there's some space savings that come to mind. You can eliminate the fans. You can actually eliminate a lot of the space inside the server. Because of the efficiency of the fluid, it, you can begin to do other things with a 2U chassis and even a 1U chassis that you couldn't ordinarily have thought about with, with air. Uh, the, uh, if you take that one step further and you now start, what we've actually been working on is air-cooled boards. So we've taken standard industry motherboards and applied fluid to them. If you take that to the extreme case and you start thinking about how could I design a motherboard that was only run in fluid, you can come up with some really, really unique uh, capabilities that we've not thought about in our industry. And I think that's probably one of the challenges for all of us is to start thinking about what, would that, what might those designs look like and what kind of densities could we drive because the thermal carrying capacity of the fluid is so much different than what we can achieve with air today. Um, I wanted to put this example up here, just kind of show you a GPU box that, I think this is the one that Facebook showed last year, uh, and talk a little bit about what we're doing in the blockchain area. Uh, one of the things that we're currently have a development effort underway is we're looking specifically at GPU deployment with the fluid for a very different space, non-traditional data center. Um, okay, it's mining, okay, I'll say, I said it out loud, so it's Ethereum. <laughs> Um, we can do things with the GPU, core memories, and clock speeds, and memories of the GPU level that you can't think about doing with air. We can run it significantly overclocked. We can get significantly higher hashing performance out of the solution by using liquid. And we're just beginning. So I think this is another area of, of optimization that we're, we intend to go after in a big way. Okay, so if I summed it all up, you know, you've heard a lot of, you've heard the liquid industry say these things a lot before. And I think what, the one thing I'd leave you with is that um, I think we're starting to reach a phase in this industry where we're starting to consider dense designs, compute capabilities, compute densities, storage densities that are beginning to challenge all of us and what we can actually deploy in data centers. And so getting proof of concepts, developing alpha models, things like that that we can begin moving forward working together on is probably where we're at in the liquid industry in this journey. So that's, uh, that kind of wraps it up for us. So I think if I did this right, we should have enough time for questions. <laughs> we got a few minutes. Yes? Can you talk about the price point of your solution? Price point. I can talk about the, talk the about price the of our fluids. So we, uh, we offer a 20 liter container of our dielectric, which is called Electrocool EC100, which is our primary product for uh, server cooling. Uh, for t lab tests, it's $200 for 20 liters. And in commercial use, it's about $50 a liter, depending on the volume. So obviously, as you get into the 20,000 and 100,000 uh, liter volumes, obviously, we can offer volume discounts on that. I think the one thing I'd tell you to pile on that at a server level is that while the fluid cost question always comes up, the other question you think about, though, is if you think about a completely liquid-cooled rack, you start to think about things a little differently, like you don't need fans, so that cost comes out. There's questions about the crack units themselves. How could you eliminate those in a data hall? So I think if you start looking at the complete infrastructure, and this is the other thing, um, where the facility teams can really help. Having a complete and total picture of the total cost of the data hall from the infrastructure all the way to the rack is really effective in helping make that decision. Um, I'm not gonna stand here and tell you that we know all those answers, because that's a very complex you know, financial question to go answer, but it's certainly something that should be, couldn't be looked at. So I think you might have uh, covered uh, the removal of fans, does that mean there's literally zero airflow required? Correct. Zero airflow, correct. 
Okay. And second question then. Well, uh, two, maybe just to follow on. So there's, there's two fan removals. First thing that we recommend absolutely is you take the fans off of the servers. The fans will operate just fine in the fluid, but all they do is burn electricity and they don't help the flow of the fluid. The second fans that we recommend you remove are all of the air handling fans in the data center if you're doing a greenfield build. That's where you get another amazing, as you know, saw earlier in one of those 33%. I think personally that's pretty conservative. Uh, most of the data centers that we see today are using well over 40% of their power just moving air around. Not to speak about the fact that most of them also don't include the dehumidifiers that are there. Uh, in those systems as another one that's often not in the PUE of the data centers because it's not considered mission critical. Okay, second question, if you don't mind. Uh, what, are the, what are the risks or added uh, steps to be taken for maintenance, say a processor had to be swapped out, things question. like that? So I can talk, uh, I'll talk specifically about the board. So there was a question earlier similar to that about the removal of the board. So the first thing to keep in mind is that while the fluid is dielectric, 60,000 volts, 5,000 amps, um, it does not uh, add a film to any of the electronics, meaning that when you have a connector or a press fit IC or anything like that, you don't have to clean the board in order to replace any of that. Um, we do offer a, a, a quick solvent. It comes in an aerosol can. It's actually not an aerosol anymore because you can't sell those in California, but it's actually in a can. You can spray it on. It'll actually clean the fluid off. Then you can do any kind of rework with a soldering iron or high heat without any problem. If you want to repurpose a board that has been in full immersion for air cooling, or if you want to return it to a manufacturer to cover a, a warranty, we have a solvent dip. It's basically a simple tank. You dip the entire board in, pull it out, you wait about um, 60 seconds, and then you basically have a clean, actually a very clean board. I think inside the server, go ahead, I'm, I'll just answer one final question, but I think inside the server, the two, other two things you got to consider is you got to consider the, I'm going to call it the skew of the fluid itself. How do you manage that? The pumps, the pumping system, which is moving the fluid through the server. And then the last one actually has not been solved yet, but we're beginning to talk to these three companies about it, but it's the hard drive. It's the number one question, right? So we're not going to ignore that. We're going to lean into that, lean into that and try to go solve that. Yeah, related to um, hard drives, you definitely want to use sealed hard drives. The fluid itself doesn't actually damage the vented right. drives, but the arms inside were never designed to move through the viscosity, so they create a tremendous number of errors. One of the applications I showed you, we've had uh, three helium 10 terabyte drives under fluid now for a year. They're fine. Yeah, actually, one of the biggest benefits that you get immediately with disk drives is when you remove the fan, because the fan creates vibration, and in these very high-capacity drives, that's a tremendous source of, of error. I don't know if you guys have seen the clapping exercise that Oracle published a number of years ago, where they basically made noise in the data center, and it created drive errors. The fluid acts as both a, a dampener to the, any kind of noise, uh, including fire alarms, which are always interesting, um, as well as uh, eliminating the fan. So I think you started to allude to it. Are you relying on an external CDU for your dielectric fluid movement and heat rejection from the primary side to the Yes, secondary absolutely. Side? Yeah. The and most cost-effective way is an external series of pumps. They're very efficient, very high MTBF. And then we always advocate using dry coolers uh, so that there's no water use. And because of the temperature, you can basically do a 60 to 50 degree C delta T over 10 C and basically be very effective. And we've had both installations. We've had both CDU installations that we use, or we use in-rack CDUs in some, I'll call it demonstrator cases. Yep. We're doing an install right now in a data center in Twin Cities. We're going to hook into the water loop. Yeah. So are we've got to. Are you, is your company providing the CDU or do you rely on no. third parties? We, on that? We, no. No. Yeah, no, no reason to reinvent the wheel. The best part about immersion cooling single phase is that the hydraulics industry has spent the last hundred years cost optimizing just about everything you can think of related to what we do, whether it's connectors, whether it's hydraulic hoses, whether it's pumps, um, and in this case, CDUs as well. The only thing that we do recommend if you are going to use an off-the-shelf CDU or an off-the-shelf dry cooler is just spec in Viton seals. Uh, they're very compatible with our fluid, and they last a long time and are resilient under maintenance. Question. 
Uh, some of the racks that we've seen out here uh, on the floor today, down oh, here close. Oh, sorry. Right there. <laughs> <Or is> it, <laughs> I knew I saw you. Power, I just I've got power where. storage devices of some type or another on them. You know, yes, yeah. batteries or yep. whatever it is, and several different types and makes and etc. Can are you guys willing to take on that kind of electronics into your immersion? Oh, absolutely. You take, you take yeah. power storage and, yep. and cool them too. How about a, how about a big UP, a rack mounted UPS system? With Actually, uh, one of the things that I'm in the process of building a demonstration of is a uh, 10,000 volt. I think it's 500 amp um, uh, arc welder and actually putting it in fluid and then arc welding to a plate with my hands in the fluid. So stay tuned for, uh, for that video. Yeah. So the answer is yes. The nice part about the fluid is because of its tremendous dielectric strength, um, we can basically place almost any electronics in without fear of any kind of shortage. And because we don't create all the micro cavitation that destroys the, the metallic and then degrades the dielectric, you know, we, we have basically our fluid has a 25 year life. We offer a 10 year warranty. Sure. One more question. We got a couple left. Couple, there. There couple. We're happy to talk with anybody outside yeah, too, yeah. so to let oh. the next speaker. There's, there's a guy right there. <laughs> he wins. Middle of the back. Oh, okay. Um, so my question is about the uh, um, evaporation. So because uh, in data center, we we need to uh, maybe frequently open it, right? So for the immersion so, so, uh, solution, right? So we need to open a uh, container and uh, maybe do um, um, service, right? So. Is the uh, evaporation and the concern? So how much we, we need have zero vapor, zero vapor, zero evaporation, zero evaporation. Unlike our competitive coolants, particularly the two phase, where they're evaporating at a tremendous rate at five hundred dollars a gallon, um, you can leave our fluid in an open vat for twenty-five years, and it has no vapor pressure. And I get challenged on that all the time. That every vapor, every chemical has a vapor pressure, and I'd be more than happy to have anyone who doubts me come and we'll heat it up to 250 degrees C and we'll measure the vapor pressure. It also has less expansion uh, than most other fluids. One of the designs I showed you and I told you we've been, our company's been around a long time, we've actually had servers that have been under a dem, you know, workload uh, operating now for eight years. Yeah. And same fluid, we haven't, we haven't changed anything out. We have, that's a lot of the pictures that we show inside. The fluid, without trying to overstate it, actually preserves electronics too, if you think about it. There is no external air pollutants that can get to those boards, so they look pristine when you pull the fluid off of them. Yeah, the other, other comment I'll make related to maintenance in this is the fact that in most of our systems, the smallest orifice is three quarters of an inch in diameter. So normally we don't even spec any kind of filter in the system. Basically, if you end up, we use a small centrifugal device that basically spins the fluid around as it travels. Basically, using that centrifugal power, it basically throws the dust off to the side, it collects in the bottom, and you vacuum it out with a wet vac. Okay, we got the sign. Thank you. Thank you.